I'll be reading from the ESV version. Daniel 10, 1 to 21. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar. And the word was true, and it was a great conflict, and he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for for the full three weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold, gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hid themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken, This word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that your heart set to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia, and came to make you understand what is happening to your people in the latter days. For the vision is for days yet to come. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. And I opened my mouth and I spoke. I said to him who stood before me, O my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me and no breath is left in me. Again, one, having the appearance of a man, touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O man greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you, be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia, and when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. And this is the word of the Lord. That's my fault. I was on mute. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks, guys. But uh, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Glad you're able to join us. And we are almost done with the book of Daniel. Um, if you've been with us through this journey, we are on chapter t- uh, 10 today. Next week, uh, next week, prepare for it's a tough one next week, a long one next week, chapter 11, and then, um, and then we'll end the week after in chapter 12. And so hopefully, th- as we've you know, journeyed through the book of Daniel, uh, that this uh, really has been helpful for you, as it has been for me. Um, you know, as the theme of this series is a hope that leads to faithfulness. And one of the things that I mentioned kind of when we began is that what this book is really about, right, is about God's faithfulness to Daniel. Right, a lot of it is made of how Daniel acted in these things, right? God, Daniel's faithfulness to God. But I think really what we see throughout the entire book of Daniel, right, is God's faithfulness to Daniel, how God was with Daniel in the midst of exile. 
And I think the prayer uh, for, for, for me, for all of us, is that just as uh, that will be good, a huge encouragement to us as well, right? Because the God who was with Daniel, right? The God who talked to Daniel, the God who appeared to Daniel is the very same God who is with us, right? Who is by our side. And my prayer is that this would be, you know, just a huge encouragement for us in our lives, right? That God continues to work in our lives uh, despite the fact that we are, you know, in some ways we are also in exile, right? We are also not... Uh, Things are not the way that it's supposed to be. We're not in, at home uh, with the Lord, right? So in some ways, we're still in exile today, uh, but yet God is continuing working in us uh, and through us. <clears throat> and so as we uh, come to this final stretch, um, you can also leave your calculators at home because, uh, you know, you won't need those anymore. But um, in this final stretch, uh, especially this particular sermon, is kind of a really hard one uh, for me to write. And the reason why... <clears throat> Uh, this it was a little bit hard, you know, for me to you know preach and write the sermon is because I I constantly face this temptation. I was writing the sermon right to kind of lessen the potential uh, strangeness uh, of this passage uh, to kind of make it more uh, palatable or acceptable to our uh, modern years. Because right, there's a lot of things in this passage that I can preach that it sounds accept- acceptable to us, right? So like things like, you know, how much God loves Daniel or how much Daniel was strengthened um, and how much, you know, Daniel was, you know, stood up and received God's word and he's greatly loved, right? There's a lot of things that are easy to preach and easy to talk about. But, and it's easy to brush over kind of the more uh, harder things in this passage that might sound kind of fantastical uh, to our modern years. So things like the concept of territorial demons, you know, often comes out of this, this passage, or, you know, the spiritual battle that is raging around us, that this passage gives us a picture of, you know, or even the spiritual, uh, the fact that there's perhaps you know, demonic or spiritual influences uh, behind a lot of the issues in our society, or even behind some of the actions of our world leaders, you know, or our government officials, that perhaps it's the work of, you know, Satan in the midst of, uh, or working in the midst, in our midst, right? And so there's some things in this passage that just sounds so, um, you know, if I could use the term like lowbrow or like unsophisticated to our modern years, right? Like, shouldn't we be like past this, right? Shouldn't, we're, we're now scientific, we're now, you know, reasonable, we're now, you know, people who, you know, have made discoveries, like, shouldn't we be past all this talk of, you know, angels and, and demons and the spiritual things and stuff like that? And, it's, you know, it's, and if you know me, I'm a very reasonable and pragmatic uh, person, right? And so <clears throat> it's not that I don't believe in miracles, right? It's not that I don't believe in God who, you know, himself is a spirit. It's not that I don't believe in angels and demons, you know, because the Bible does make it clear that they exist, although maybe not in the pictures that our society paints for us of what angels and demons are supposed to look like. Um, but yet, you know, when I, whenever I look at a life situation, whenever I look at a you know, worship service, when I, look at, when I look at people, you know, I tend to lean towards like really rational or even scientific or reasonable explanations uh, for things. Right, and so all this talk about, you know, uh, angels and demons, it feels like, why can't we just be past this in, in some ways, right? And so, but yet, this is the reality that the Bible presents for us. This is the spiritual reality that the Bible gives us. And so we can't shy away from this topic. In fact, we probably have to insist, actually, that it is true. But even uh, though people are, you know, and there's this real phenomenon, I feel like, in society, though, where, like, you know, people are really rational and scientific about a lot of things. But then I feel like even though there's a rise in rational and scientificness and, and you know, and that, but there's also seems to be a rise at the very same time of spirituality, right? So there's a decline in religiosity when, you know, like, going to church and, like, institutionalized religion, but there's actually a rise in spirituality. So like all the time you hear things, you know, like, you know, life coaches, you know, talking about like, you know, self-help books or meditation or yoga or astrology or people talk about zodiac signs, you know, or horoscopes. You know, it's just like people don't actually shy away from talking about spiritual things, right? Actually, people talk about spiritual things a lot, right? People look for non-naturalistic explanations of things in their lives, you know, and so even though there's this like, decline in religion, there's still this desire, I feel like, in society or this acceptedness in society that life is more than just what we see here in the physical world. 
And so maybe it's not too crazy, you know, for Christians to insist that there is a spiritual element to our lives, right? That we're not just made of, you know, the physical, the rational, the scientific, but there's more, right? There's more to us than just uh, flesh and blood. There's more that's going around in the world than just these naturalistic explanations. And so... And perhaps the best New Testament passage that explains this to us is in Ephesians uh, chapter 6. <clears throat> and this will probably sound familiar uh, to, to many of you. And so Ephesians chapter 6, uh, if you can click for me. This is not, is this my fault too? All right, so Ephesians chapter 6, it says, uh, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Right, and so this passage makes it really clear to us. What is it, right? What is the reality that Paul is warning against? Right, that there's not just against flesh and blood, but there's spiritual things that we are battling as well. And what's really interesting is after giving this statement, uh, what comes after this, right? What comes after this in verses 13 to 18? Well, it's the passage about putting on the armor of God, right? So he's, Paul is saying, despite, you know, this is the battle that we face, what comes right after is, then therefore put on the armor of God, right? He says, put on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, right, which is the word of the God. And he's saying, given the spiritual realities that we have in our lives, put on uh, this armor of God. And as I was thinking about Daniel chapter 10, uh, I thought that this was actually a really good example of what it looks like to put on the armor of God, right? So if you want like a practical example of what it means, what it looks like for someone to put on the armor of God, I think we don't have to look any further than Daniel chapter 10, right? This is a great example of what it looks like to put on uh, this armor of God. So as we walk through this passage, um, I'll warn you, it's going to get a little bit strange, um, but perhaps let's, you know, open up our eyes to what God might be teaching us through this passage. And I trust that in studying this passage, it's going to equip us uh, to better deal with the many battles that we face in our lives. So with that, let's uh, jump in. So starting in verse 1, uh, let me just give you some, some background of, of what's going on here. So starting in verse 1, it says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar. This is not, uh, different than the king, Belshazzar. This is Daniel's name, Belteshazzar, uh, that Nebuchadnezzar gave him. Uh, and the word was true, and it was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for three full weeks. All right, so when we left off in Daniel chapter 9, remember we talked about like the 70 weeks and all that confusing stuff last week, but <clears throat> between chapter 9 and chapter 10 uh, was about two years. And so chapter 9 uh, happened in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia. And so now we are in the third year of uh, the king of Persia. And it says that Daniel was mourning for three weeks. And not only was he mourning for three weeks, uh, he was also, in some ways, he wasn't like 100% fasting, uh, but it does say that he wasn't eating food. He, he, it does say that he was limiting himself to just like basic food, right? Because it says that he was keeping away from the delicacies, the meat and the wine, right? But he was doing this for three weeks, right? And he was mourning and he was praying. And in a little bit, we're going to find out exactly why he had to do this for three uh, full weeks, <clears throat> And the question is, why was Daniel mourning uh, in the first place? And the text doesn't exactly tell us, but I think we do have some pretty good guesses based on what was happening uh, specifically in Jerusalem at that time. So remember, right, this happened in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. But if we jump over, flip over to Ezra chapter 1, we actually figure out what happens in the first year of Cyrus. Right, so in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. It says, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, whoever is among you of all his people, let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is Jerusalem. And so in the first year of his reign, Cyrus made a decree, and we talked a little bit about this last week, that letting the Jewish people right, go back and rebuild uh, Jerusalem. But then it says in Ezra 4, then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Then the work on the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped and it ceased until the second year of the reign of, of Darius, king of Persia. So by the way, this is a, a different Darius than the one mentioned in, in chapter 9. But basically what happened is, you know, Cyrus makes a decree, right? They go back and rebuild. And... 
a, couple of year, a couple of months after into the rebuilding project, it basically comes to a complete, uh, a complete halt. All right, the Jewish people, they met some serious opposition. And actually for about 18 years, there was no work done in the temple at all. There's no work done to rebuild Jerusalem. So right, even after they went back from exile, right, there's, they faced a ton of opposition. And you can read about this in Ezra and Nehemiah. And it really wasn't until Haggai and Zechariah and Ezra and Nehemiah kind of got the people going again that they rebuilt it. But it took, after there was like this 18 year break where they're just not doing any work, even though they were home uh, after the exile. I mean, we can't know this for sure, but I think it's likely that this is the reason why Daniel was mourning, right? Because, you know, there's a, everyone's going back, and it's great, right? And the temple's going to be rebuilt. Jerusalem's going to be rebuilt. But then he hears news that everything has come to a halt. And I think this is maybe why that, you know, he's mourning, right? He's praying, uh, even though he is, and he's not there, but he's praying. And, and so the other thing that I think is worth noting is why is Daniel still in Persia? I and mean, I kind of found this interesting as well, right? Like if Cyrus already made a decree for everyone to go back, right? What is Daniel still doing? What is Daniel still doing in, in Persia? You know, in my mind, I would think that maybe Daniel would be the first, right, to lead the exiles uh, back to Jerusalem and be one of the first ones to go, like leading the whole pack. And, you know, we can't really be sure why Daniel is still in Persia at this time. You know, possibly it's because of his old age, you know, because Daniel was uh, in his mid 80s uh, at this point. Uh, or maybe God just told him, you know, not to go uh, because there was still work that God wanted Daniel to do uh, in Persia. And, and I think specifically, as we see here in Daniel 10, uh, there was, a, I think, a work that God needed Daniel to do, and that was to pray. Right? D- God needed Daniel. Daniel needed to pray for uh, his people. And I think what's interesting here is that, you know, even though uh, many of us may not fall into the life stage or the life category or the age of, of uh, Daniel here, and, and I am of the conviction, right, that as long as you are alive, right, God has a plan for you, right? I think, you know, Daniel, Daniel was clearly nearing the, you know, twilight stage of his life, but yet we see him here mourning, fasting, and praying, right, on behalf of God's people, I think, you know, I think it's important for us to have this conviction when we're younger, right? That no matter what stage of life that we are in, whether we're mobile or whether we can't go anywhere, but wherever stage of life that we're in, right, God still has a work for us to do, right? And, and even if that simply means to, to pray. And as we're going to see, given the spiritual realities around us, right, that's actually one of the most important things that we can do is, uh, is to pray. Um, and so... We'll get into that. And so, you know, I think really what we see here, even though Daniel was at the end of his life, right, this is the very last vision that Daniel would receive. God still had a plan and purpose in his life, right? And so I think it's important for us to, you know, as long as we're alive, right, that God has a plan, God has a work uh, for us to be doing. So let's keep going. Verse 4. And so it says, On the 24th day of the first month, uh, I was standing on the bank of the great river that is the Tigris. And I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz, that's apparently a place where gold comes from, around his waist, and his body was like beryl. A beryl is like a a gemstone of like a yellowish, greenish uh, kind of color. So his body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of the burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. All right, so there's a fair bit of debate as to who exactly uh, this person is. And so some people look at this and say, oh, I know, this got to be Jesus, right? If you have a, <laughs> someone asks a question in church, the answer is probably Jesus. And so people are like, okay, this got to be Jesus. And there's good evidence for that. If you, even if you, like, if you flip over, we're not going to go there, but if you go to Revelation chapter 1, uh, Jesus is described there with a very similar kind of description. But on the other hand, uh, this might not be Jesus, uh, because as we'll see, this guy comes into great conflict with the k- prince of the kingdom of Persia, right? And he was wrestling so much with this prince of, prince of the kingdom of Persia that he needed Michael, the archangel, to help him, right? So he was wrestling, and he's like, hey, ain't Michael, you got to come help me. And so, like, in some ways, like, if this was Jesus, I don't feel like he would need Michael's help, you know, to defeat, you know, whatever, you know, demon or spiritual battle he was fighting. And so... You know, it's possibly that this is, you know, not actually uh, Jesus. So the way that I take it is that this is not actually Jesus, um, although I probably want him to be. But, uh, but probably this is just some kind of uh, angelic being that God used to uh, bring a message to Daniel. But in some ways, it doesn't really matter uh, who he is because it doesn't change the message, right, that he has for Daniel. So let's see what this uh, message is. And so 
It says, and he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, <clears throat> understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you, and when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. And he said, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humble yourself before your God, your words have been heard. Right? Notice it says, from the very first day that Daniel started to pray, God heard his words. And it says, I have come because of your words, right? So the prayer of Daniel uh, uh, um, uh, reached God and God sent this messenger. Uh, Then verse 13, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. And so essentially what is happening here, right, is that, that God answered, God heard Daniel's prayer, God sent an angel, this angel could not get to Daniel, it took him 21 days of wrestling, and Michael the archangel had to come and help him before he was able to deliver this message to Daniel. And that's why Daniel was fasting for three weeks, right? It's not that God didn't hear him, it's just that the messenger that God sent took three weeks in order to get to him. Of course, Daniel didn't know that, you know, as he was praying. And so... Here, this passage in Daniel, this exact passage in Daniel, is one of the clearest passages that we have in the Bible of what some would call territorial demons. Because that's kind of what happened, right? There was a prince of the king of Persia. Daniel, the angel, tried to get to Daniel and couldn't. And had to wrestle for 21 days before he was able uh, to get there. And this is where people talk about these kind of territorial demons that do not allow kind of, God's angels to kind of penetrate and, and kind of bring messages to God's, uh, God's people. So, you know, what are we to make of this, right? Like, what are we to make of a passage like this one? <clears throat> um, so when I was in seminary, uh, my professor told me the story of uh, a former student of his who was, uh, so one time she was on a flight from somewhere, I don't remember where, uh, into New York. And, um, and she was telling my professor that <clears throat> as she was getting closer to the city, you know, all of a sudden she felt like, at one point, she felt like she crossed through a barrier of some kind. And her mood got, you know, considerably darker uh, than it was before, right? So she was on a flight, and she kind of just crossed this point where she was nearing New York City and just felt like, you know, she crossed something, and she felt, you know, just felt like something was not, uh, not, or just like there's this presence, you know, that was cov- governing or covering the entire city. When she was, you know, telling my professor this and said that, you know, she was likely, feel like she likely kind of experienced this kind of territorial demons that she was talking, that Daniel 10 here is talking about. Now, if you're like me, you know, your brain is thinking, your brain is working as it should be, right, hopefully. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for this, right? In my head, I was like, maybe this was just a, you know, psychosomatic response. Maybe she was just really stressed, you know, and so she felt something. Or maybe she imagined it, right? Maybe, or maybe she, uh, or maybe because she knew about this passage, you know, this, she was just experiencing that confirmation bias, right? It's like, she's more likely to think that this is true based on her experience. And I mean, there are just like, I could sit here and just come up with dozens and dozens of reasons of why uh, to explain Right, what was happening to her, what she has experienced. You know, but you know, um, because of what the Bible says right, about spiritual things and because of Daniel 10, right, so what do I think? I do think that it is possible, if not probable, that this is still how Satan continues to work today. Right, that if this is how Daniel, Satan continue, works in, in, in Daniel's time, you know, why would he kind of change up his strategy now? That this is, you know, it's maybe even probable that there are entire, you know, regions or cities or areas where he is actively, right, actively darkening uh, the minds of those uh, who are there. So, you know, I think in order to kind of process this and think about this, um, you know, maybe it would be helpful to think about the opposite scenario. So instead of thinking about, you know, Spirit, when we talk about like spirituality, instead of talking about demons, if we talk about the other side, right, the opposite uh, scenario, right, oftentimes we say that when someone comes to know Jesus, right, we fe- we, it, is, it requires a work of the Holy Spirit uh, in their lives. And maybe this is your experience as well, right? For each one of us, maybe when we think about how do we come to know Christ, right, there was probably something that brought you to God, right, or something that made God more real to you in your life, right? It wasn't just you know, physical. It wasn't just your circumstances, but there's probably something, right? Something that made God really real to your life. <clears throat> I heard this, you know, short story this past week. So, you know, Spar- Charles Spurgeon, who is, you know, some people 
think he's the greatest preacher uh, of all time, and, and so he's a preacher from London. And so this one time he was, he's this great preacher, and so this one time he was preaching in this big auditorium uh, in London. And so he decided to go beforehand to check out the acoustics, right? So this is before there's mics and, you know, amplification. And so he says, oh, let me go beforehand to this big, big, big auditorium, and let me uh, ch- test the acoustics. And so he tested the acoustics by standing on stage, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so that's what he said, you know, just to test out uh, what the acoustics would sound like. Well, unbeknownst to him, right, there was actually a workman way, way, way up high in the rafters, right, who wasn't a Christian, and he heard this voice, right, come, you know, ring out in the auditorium, and he was like, he came under great conviction, and he was like, hmm, I've got to figure out what this means. Right? I don't know if he thought it was God. Eventually, he figured out that it was Spurgeon. But, you know, and so he went and studied it. He's like, what does this mean? And eventually, he became a Christian. And it's like, why does this happen? Right? Why is it that sometimes people can hear the gospel preached you know, hundreds of times in their lives, and yet you know, their lives are still without effect? And why is it that a workman can hear one line? Right, one line, and he be convicted, you know, and eventually converted as a Christian. Right, why is it that when Peter preached in Pentecost, right, three thousand people came to know Christ? Right, but sometimes missionaries can preach for thirty years, right, and barely uh, even a soul will come uh, to know him. You know, and so why is it that sometimes these things happen? I think the Bible tells us that you can't just explain this through a naturalistic means. Right, that, that there is a spiritual battle that is happening. You know, whether or not we realize it or not. You know, or kind of take more recent events. And so I don't know if you guys are caught up with, you know, this news. But um, <clears throat> uh, about two weeks ago, some of you probably have heard of the revival, or some people call it revival, that's happening in Kentucky uh, right now in Asbury College. So if you haven't heard about this, I guess you guys aren't are on TikTok because apparently... It had like 24 million views on TikTok or something like that. And so apparently what happened um, is that uh, two, basically two Wednesdays ago, so not this past Wednesday, but the Wednesday before, in Asbury College, which is a Methodist Christian college. Uh, you know, so Christian college, they always have their like normal chapel time uh, for their students. Well, after this, uh, after the benediction to the chapel time, which was described as a completely unremarkable service, it was just, you know, just your normal chapel time that they have for students, uh, the students decided not to leave and decided to continue to sing. And so, still quite unremarkable, but it was, it was said, and so they were prompted to stay, right? So this group of students continue to stay there, and they continue to sing, and they continue to worship, and as far as I know, I checked yesterday, um, that this worship service is still going on. Uh, to this day. And so this started two Wednesdays ago, and it just basically has gone on 24-7 uh, throughout these past uh, two and a half weeks in, in Asbury. And, you know, so what, what do we make of this, right? What do we make of the fact that, you know, this is happening? And so people are really excited, you know, this is, you know, potentially, you know, is, is this God working? Is this a, is this a you know, a revival? Is something going to happen from this? And as I'm thinking about this, you know, I, it's, I find it that this has to be a work uh, of the Spirit. And I think the reason why I believe this is a work of the Spirit is because there's been no effort to manufacture uh, what's going on. Right? I always think it's kind of funny when you go to a revival service. Like, how do you know there's going to be a revival service? Like, you can't control the Spirit, you know, to have a revival. You know, so, I mean, you can go and pray for revival, you know, if that's what they mean. And uh, that's fine. But, but the fact that, you know, there's, there's been no, like, there's no manufacturing here. Uh, the school hasn't tried to hype it up. And, and, and by all accounts, it just started completely unremarkable, right? Completely unplanned. Right? But, but not only that, I think, you know, they, they've, there's been preaching there. And the preaching hasn't been, like, super high energy. Uh, it's just, you know, they're preaching the gospel. It's just a normal uh, preaching. And a lot of it has been quiet, reflective. People are confessing their sins. People are reading scripture. People are praying. Um, and... Now, there's actually, if you go online, there's like a live stream of it, not set up by the university, but set up by uh, another organization, and it just looks normal. It just, people are just singing, <laughs> you know, it's like people are praising God. It just looks, uh, you know, completely uh, normal. And so, I, you know, for me, I'm inclined to believe that this is truly a work of the Spirit, right? This is truly a, uh, maybe an outpouring of the Spirit uh, that is going on right now. 
Now, now, and real quick, I'll mention that you know the length of time that it's been going, you know, is something that I'm a little bit wary of. Uh, not that it hasn't happened in the past, right? If you you know, like the Azula Street Revival or even Asbury, there's been a revival that's gone on for more than two weeks. Um, but this is probably the most attention a revival has got in the age of social media. And so, you know, there's just thousands of people who've heard about this in social media and are flocking to Asbury, you know, to, pars- to, to, to see what is going on and to, you know, experience uh, God there. And so... Um, and I hope, right, that just as this was started by the Spirit, that this would likewise be ended by the Spirit. Um, and now there's a kind of an incentive to keep it going, right, because there's receiving a lot of um, media attention. And so there's like an incentive to be like, oh, yeah, let's prove to the world that, that God is real. But hopefully, I think, you know, if God decides, Holy Spirit decides to say, okay, you know, we're done. And then hopefully they'll, you know, be put to an end. Uh, but, you know, there's... Um, you know, and in some ways, I also hesitate to call it a revival because previous revivals, right? There's always a long-term impact on church and on society, right? When you look at the great, like first Great Awakening, second Great Awakening, there's always a long-term impact uh, that happens. And you know, as someone once said, you know, the the whole point of spiritual highs or the whole point of spiritual experiences is really not about how high you go, but it's really about how straight you walk uh, once you come back down, right? And so even, you know, especially when we were in high school, you maybe experienced a lot of spiritual highs, you know, spiritual ups and downs, right? It's really not about how high you go right, or how low you go even, right? It's about how straight you walk uh, once uh, you get back to what is, you know, normal life. And so, you know, why do I say all this? And the reason why I say all of this is because, you know, if we are to believe that the Holy Spirit is indeed at work in our world today, Right? If we believe that the Holy Spirit is at work, then I think it's likewise also the case right, that demons and Satan continues to work uh, as well. Right? And the thing is, like, we don't want to swing too far and become too obsessed with this topic. You know, so some of you may have heard of the book, um, This Present Darkness. I don't think it's as famous nowadays, but there's this book, uh, it's a fiction novel called This Present Darkness. I don't exactly recommend it, although now that I say that, you're probably going to go read it, but, you know, it's, it is a work of fiction, but for example, you know, it's, it's a work of fiction, so it's like, angels are probably not hiding in trunks of cars to infiltrate uh, demon-influenced territory, you know, or our prayers probably aren't causing the swords of angels to vibrate with power, uh, which is some of the examples uh, mentioned in the book. <clears throat> So I think we shouldn't be too obsessed with these things, right? We, sh- we shouldn't think that if we, turn on a shower, if we turn on our shower that a demon comes out, right? It's like maybe a little bit going too far, you know, when it comes to uh, these things. So I don't think we want to be too obsessed uh, with this, but we're likely more, we're more likely, I think, to fall in the opposite category or the opposite error, right? Which is to completely fail to recognize the presence of demonic forces or the presence of these uh, spiritual things uh, in the world. Right, so as uh, C.S. Lewis writes his screw tape letters, uh, which is a, a book I do recommend, but it says, um, you know, the best thing that Satan can do is to make us think that he doesn't exist, right? And so the whole book is about the senior demon giving advice to a younger demon, and he's like, hey, every time humans think about Satan, like, make them think about a dude with red horns and tights, because everyone's just going to be like, well, that's the most ridiculous thing. That obviously can't exist, right? And, and, and it's going to lead us to not, um, you know, believe that the devil and demons are actually working, right? And so he says, you know, instead, the Bible tells us that, you know, that Satan is also called the great deceiver, right? So often the ways he sh- shows up is going to be in deceptive ways, right? Causing doubt, you know, or subtly moving us away from God. All right, so I think all this is to say is I think one application that we can draw out from our text today is to simply be more aware of the spiritual battle that is taking place. Right? Maybe not in everything, not everywhere, not all at once, but recognize right, that maybe behind the discontentment or the struggles or the doubt or the things that we struggle with in life, right, that, or maybe in, even in the lives of others, that perhaps there is a spiritual battle that is going on. And so I think if we're going to be more aware of the spiritual battle, uh, what are we to do? And so let me just end with these two quick uh, applications. So the first one is don't be afraid, and the second one is to pray. All right, so if we're aware of the spiritual battle that's going on, what are, what are two things we can do? First, don't be afraid. So Daniel 18, it says, Again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O man greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened 
and said, let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. <clears throat> you know, Daniel here is clearly p- pretty overwhelmed by this vision. And, he re- and so the man reassures Daniel and says, you are greatly loved. Be strong and be of good courage. Right? This has echoes of what God says to Joshua. Right? Be strong and courageous. Do not fear for the Lord, with, Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And so I think uh, even as we consider these things, it might invoke some fear. It might invoke some trepidation among us. Uh, but as, you know, as First John tells us, he says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. Them here, he's talking about evil spirits. And then he says, for he who is in you, meaning the Holy Spirit, is greater than he who is in the world. All right, so I think the first application here is, is do not fear. Right, the second application, I think, is simply to spend more time in prayer. Right, because I think one of the uh, implications of recognizing the spiritual battle that is around us is that it uh, really can motivate us to pray. Right, I found myself praying more this past week for this Sunday service. Right, that God would uh, really open up our minds and hearts uh, to, uh, of his people to who he is, praying against right, that, 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 the, that, that, that Satan who tries to deceive us, who tries to cloud our minds, right, that God would make his word clear, right, through this, through this uh, service. Or we can pray for, you know, the people in our, our small group, right, that, that despite our busy schedules, that really it can be a time where people can come together, you know, worship God and to fellowship together, right? We can pray that those are struggling, right, that they would find refreshment in the Lord, Right, we pray for our community, for our city, for our country. For our I think one of the things that as we become more aware right, of, the spirit, of this spiritual fact, of these spiritual things, that there's a spiritual battle going on, there ends up being just endless things to pray for. Right? Like if this spiritual battle is going on, it kind of adds a whole other dimension to our prayers. Right? And I think it really gives us another motivation uh, for us to pray. You know, while I said in the beginning, this is a challenging uh, message to preach, right? Much rather focus on things that we can see uh, and touch. You know, but I also believe that there's much more to this world than just uh, physical things, right? And so as an application, so when we pray, right, as we pray right now, right, let us pray that God would protect us. Let us pray that God would guard us from accusations from the evil one. And let us all be able to stand firm, right, knowing that we belong to God, Right, for all of us can say, right, greater is he that is in us than he who is in the world. Right, so let's pray together. God, we do indeed um, come before you. Um, and as we come before you, um, we know that our prayers are being heard by you. We know that even as these words are being spoken, that this very instant, our words are being heard by you. And yet you communicate to us through Christ that we are greatly loved. Uh, in many ways, we put on the helmet of salvation. We put on the breastplate of righteousness because we know, Lord, that we are greatly loved because of what Christ has done for us. But Father, as you have described uh, the faith and righteousness and, and salvation as armor, uh, Father, we put these on because we know that there are constantly accusations from the evil one, uh, accusations to make us doubt who we are, accusations to make us feel like we're not, uh, we're not people who are of worth, we're accusations to, to, to say that we are not uh, capable or we're not able, and there's... Um, just so, so many things in which um, you know, the Satan and the, and, and the devil could throw at us. Uh, Father, so we pray that you would protect us. We pray, even as it says in Psalms, that you have sent your angels uh, to, to protect us from the evil one. And would you not lead us uh, into temptation? Um, but deliver us uh, from, from evil. And so let us, uh, in, in each of our hearts, um, have this stir in us a desire to really pray. Pray for one another, pray for our church, pray for our city, our community. Uh, Father, for we know that our prayers are effective because they're being heard by you. And oftentimes, you, and very often, you use our prayers to accomplish your perfect will uh, in this world. So, Father, help us to be aware uh, of these things, uh, and would you, uh, would, would you stir us, stir in our hearts more of a desire uh, to love you and to pray to you and to find our hope and our rest in you 